All right, last but not least, our final topic for this afternoon is called Tough Harvest Teach Us Lessons. Our moderator will be Ernie Sursky, a producer from Dauphin, Manitoba. And our speakers are Lionel Caskew, Farm Production Advisor with Manitoba Agriculture Resource and Development, and Angela Brackenreed, agronomist with the Canola Council of Canada. Angela is an agronomist with the Canola Council of Canada. Her focus since joining the Council in 2012 has been on the optimization of canola harvest and storage. storage. She spends most of her free time and all of her money spending farming with her family in justice. Lionel is a farm production extension specialist for crops with Manitoba Agriculture Resource and Development. He grew up on his family farm in the Rosburn area and currently operates a farm with his brother Terry. They are raising purebred Simmental cattle and seeding most of their acres down for feed. Please join me in welcoming Lionel, Anna, Angela, and Ernie to the stage. Well, thank, thank you very much, Nikki, and it's indeed a pleasure to welcome Angela and Lionel uh, to us here this evening. I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity, or the misfortune is probably the better word, of driving into your yard and seeing a bin that doesn't have any snow on it. Well, we'll go through some of those things today, and uh, I have the personal experience because Remembrance Day of this last year, I was actually vacuuming out a grain bin, and you'll see the results of what happened when you put tough wheat into a bin and you kind of forget about it for a while. So, I'll, first of all, uh, let's welcome Lionel Caskey. Lionel. Well, thanks everybody for. Uh for hanging on and staying out here today to listen to the presentation. Uh, like Ernie mentioned, uh, this past year has been a bit of an experience and uh, I'm going to spend... Uh, where do I point this at? Oh. Perfect. Okay, this is uh, the first slide here, and uh, this will be what Ernie was talking about, I guess, uh, a little surprise he received when he went to uh, move some grain out of the bin, and from talking to producers over the last four or five days here, and uh, even all this fall, I don't think this is something that's very uncommon. Um, I think uh, one of the key things we need to do is definitely keep an eye on some of the storage issues that we uh, encountered this fall when we were putting grain in the bin, and we'll delve into that a little bit more, but uh, I think for the start here, just a bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, a review, sorry, a review of, uh, of the past fall. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about some storage challenges, uh, some managing of the high moisture grain, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about at the end about uh, what to do with some of this grain that's overwintering out in the field. Uh, we did have some experience last year with some producers that uh, had grain that sat out all winter, and uh, we learned a few things, so I, we thought we'd be a, a good opportunity to maybe go over a few of those things. So uh, I guess just a little bit of the review. We had a great start this year. We got out early. Uh, by the end of April, I was talking to producers that had all the cereal crops in, and some of them were taking a break to, uh, to seed, uh, seed canola, uh, but uh, some were just continuing and, and uh, seeding their canola right away. I think that's one of the issues that we ran into right off the start of the year. Uh, we really need to uh, start looking at our soil temperatures and, uh, and making sure we're seeding into proper soil temperatures to get that crop growing because we really ran into problems with slow germination this year. Uh, we then later on ran into some other problems regarding insects, but uh, I think uh, that's one of the issues uh, that's a take-home issue from this year is uh, we, need, uh, we need to be watching our soil, our soil moisture. The next thing that hit us this year is a fairly dry spring, dry and cool, and uh, a lot of that uh, seed sat in dry soil and actually didn't, didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to germinate. Later on in the season, the temperature warmed up, but then that's when uh, the stuff started to germinate, and that's when the flea beetles and cutworms started to be an issue. And we had reports of, you know, 800-some claims of, of reseeding uh, issues uh, that needed to be happening uh, because of uh, poor germination, uh, poor, uh, poor uh, 
ability to fight off uh, flea beetles and, and cutworms. And uh, one of the things we tend to forget is uh, the, the clock starts the day you put the seed in the ground for canola. So your, your seed treatment, uh, the clock starts that day. So if it sits in the ground for two weeks or two weeks plus like it did this spring, when it came up, uh, not only was it struggling to come up, but it then had flea beetle pressure, so we lost a lot of canola fields that way. Then, uh, you know, we did get some rain later on in the season. The crop started to come in, and actually, surprisingly well, the crop did take off, and we had a pretty good crop in the field there. Um, but uh, then, as the last uh, last slide said, or the last comment says, there, then came the harvest from hell. Here's just a picture of some of the flea beetle damage that we were seeing in the, early in the spring and the cutworm damage. This is something interesting that uh, we uh, uh, received the other day in the office. And when you look at the two, uh, the two maps, you got the growing degree days from May 1st uh, to May 31st of 2019. And you see that for most of Manitoba, we were struggling to reach 70% of our, our normal growing degree days. So, cold soil, cool temperatures, and, rain, and some sparse rain, we had a really, uh, really some major issues in getting that crop growing for the whole month of May. When you look at June, uh, we, were right, we were just working our way to getting to normal for growing degree days. That's when we got the grain, and that's when the crops started coming up. So late August, uh, we actually, uh, I was surprised that we did get started as harvest as, as quick as we did. Uh, we uh, got a lot of producers out in the field. I think one of the issue, one of the things we learned this year too is that when the crop is, uh, a lot of our cereal crops, when they're ready to go, and what I mean by ready to go, when they're in a moisture level that you feel you can manage them in your yard, you probably should start taking some of that harvest off. There was a lot of producers this year that had uh, grain testing 16, 16, 5, and, and weren't willing to combine even though they had the capability of aerating grain. I think one of the things we did learn this year is that if you have the ability to artificially dry grain, um, take advantage of that because uh, it was probably a week after uh, you know, middle of September range is when the rain started and a lot of that opportunity that producers had to get some of that grain and being in good quality uh, actually was lost because, uh, because uh, they were wanting to take it off dry. I know it was early in the year, but I think that's something that we, uh, we need to take forward and I think a lot of producers have uh, definitely a lot of talk about grain drying, uh, developing better aeration, so I think that's something that's, uh, that's going to be something we look, for, look uh, into the future as uh, when we get into more harvest. When you look at our precipitation for, uh, for the year from May through to September, you see the southwest corner actually uh, received a fair bit. We were over, in most areas, over 130% of normal. And most of that rain in the fall came right after probably the second week of September right through to October. So, uh, you know, that's when we received the majority of our rain, and that's why a lot of the harvest became very difficult to get. When you look at the overall uh, uh, harvest completed by that time, and you look at Manitoba, for the end of September, we were about 50 to 55 percent complete in the western side of the province. And when you go to the eastern side, uh, we're more in that 60 to 65 percent. So uh, for uh, a year that started off where we thought uh, the crop was in early and we were going to get it off early, uh, we're knocking on the first days of October and we're still only half done the harvest. When you look at our growing degree days, and this is something else that hurt us in the fall, when you look at our growing degree days in September to September 30th, we actually did really well. We caught up and that's what brought some of the crop in, but what would hurt us is when we get into October. From October 1st to the 31st, we were less than 60% of our growing degree days. And that alone there made for difficulty in, first of all, drying off all the rain we received in the fall, and then later on, uh, drying off uh, a lot of the snow we received. Here's just an image of some of the fields that I was in later in September, and you can see the sprouts uh, 
coming out of the swath and, and heads uh, of wheat that were sprouted uh, big time at this point. Uh, a lot of uh, issues started to uh, come up now as to what to do with crop like that. And uh, at that point, it was a lot of uh, salvage, salvage value is what guys were looking at. Here's uh, another picture as we uh, look at some of the oats fields. And then uh, we got this picture of a soybean field. Uh, this would be into October where we uh, received rain and then a real cold morning. And you can see where it would probably, probably take way past noon for even just uh, the frost to get off some of those plants. Another thing we learned uh, that uh, strike cut canola was uh, drying down a lot faster for producers than canola that was in swaths. So uh, uh, talking to uh, more producers lately, uh, one of the comments I uh, just got the other day was, uh, I'm going to grow all strike cut canola, but I'm going to swath the early stuff so we can get harvesting quicker and then I'm going to strike cut the rest. But uh, a comment that definitely was made all through harvest was that uh, uh, you could get into strike cut canola probably two days earlier, and uh, it was a lot drier than swath canola at that time. Then we get into about the 10th or, or the 7th of October, and uh, this is when the snowfall came through, and this, this is what sealed it off for quite a few producers. Uh, some areas, like the Holland area, received anywhere from uh, 18 to 21 uh, inches of snow, uh, which uh, brought the crop way down. And as you can see in the pictures, this was pretty common. Uh, a little different than what we received in uh, the previous year for the producers that had crop over winter. You can see a lot of the wheat in this picture that, that was broken down. And a lot of those heads were starting to fall off. And I think that's one of the issues we're going to deal with this spring. And I'll talk about that later on as to how we're going to deal with some of that crop. This was a canola field that, uh, again, received that same snowfall. Uh, this producer actually got out and harvested this canola later on, and you can see that uh, it, uh, it did uh, lodge a fair bit. Uh, difficult harvesting was the big issue, uh, and difficult getting it dry. And uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's an issue that was pretty common. And then the wear and tear and equipment. I think uh, a lot of producers uh, learned how to pull a combine out, pull a grain cart out, pull out silage equipment. I think there was a pretty, pretty good learning curve this fall as we tried to get and do our best to get, the, get that crop off. So I'm going to turn it over to Angela now, and Angela's going to talk a little bit about uh, storage and our, some of the challenges we're uh, facing in storage. Just a quick question, Lionel. What kind of... Uh when we're looking at the overwintered crops out there, and there is a fair bit in, in this province, what kind of challenges are we going to be facing? And, and I guess the other next question is, is it going to be worthwhile going after those crops? Yeah, and that's uh, something I'm going to just mention on a little bit later here, but I think, uh, I think it's going to be field by field, and that's what we learned from last year. Um, some of the fields there, uh, first of all, isn't going to be the ability to take that crop off. Uh, there's going to be enough broken heads, there's going to be enough sprouted seed that it's not going to be worth your while in dollars and cents to take it off. Um, I'm going to mention later that we're going to need to uh, really uh, work closely with MASC. Um, a lot of producers that I've talked to are probably above their coverage now, so they may not be in a claim position with the crop that's remaining out there. So it's going to become a decision with the producer, with that producer as to how he wants to treat the crop that's out there. There are options, and I will, I'll touch on them a little bit later here. Thanks, Lionel. Uh, Angela will now join us and present some of the challenges of, of storing a crop that's less than ide under less than ideal conditions. Angela. All right. Thanks, Ernie. Um, it was Ernie's idea to have this session, I believe. And uh, he had some pretty good questions um, around storage. I don't know, Ernie, might, might it make more sense for you to just ask some of those kind of key questions you had and I'll see if I can go through addressing some of them slide by slide or you want me to just go and... Well, uh, what I can do, and, and, and it sort of go, leads in from that uh, one of those slides you saw from, from, my, uh, from my somewhat challenged tweet bin that I had, 
I guess my first question is, what's, what's the actual impact and what's, what, how does it affect the storage and the grading of the grain that's maybe been heated a little bit and been stored under less than ideal conditions? How does it impact for future storability once it's already deteriorated a little bit, or how does it impact for grade? How, would it, how, how that and why it impact, <clears throat> excuse me, why it impacts the grade and what you would do with it going forward? Right. So, um, great question. Those are the slides that I took out of my presentation. <laughs> um, but we actually, if you go, we run a, a website called Canola Watch, and uh, for, for canola in particular, so I'm with the Canola Council, so I can speak mostly to canola. We, we keep a list going of buyers of, of heated canola, and there's good reason why it has uh, reduced value. Uh, it, uh, you have to refine that out. It, it impacts odor. It impacts t taste. And you have to remember these are people, consumers, that are eating this, right? It is a, a food stock. Um, and so they don't really, that might turn someone off if they open up their canola and it stinks and it looks a little weird. Um, but it also, more importantly, impacts shelf life of canola. So, um, you know, there is certain tolerances of heated canola in, in each grade, but it's really, really limited and there's good reason for that. The problem with it is, is we have such limited buyers. They're smaller buyers, smaller players, like not our majors, um, and it's hard to find them. So we keep this list going on Canola Watch so people can see the options that they have, but, but those markets become full really, really quick because they're just, you know, smaller hydrate colonies or something that are doing maybe some biodiesel stuff or lubricants or something like that. So. Okay, thanks. So what do, what, what do we do with the tough grain that we have in the, in, in the bin now? Like, Okay. Uh, we've got some grain in storage. Uh, we might have some in bags. What would be the uh, the best options going forward with that grain? Sure. So so that's what I'll uh, kind of talk about in the next uh, ten slides that I have. Is why did why are we in this situation? What do we do now? Um, so I guess one backstory. These are all uh, my photos. So maybe the lesson looks like cases get stuck more than anything else. It just so happened to be those are the only pictures that I had, and one of them is on my own farm. Um, I inherited a old 1660, fairly light combine from my dad. He bought it in 1997. Um, so it's a lot older than me. It's not worth anything, so we keep running it. But uh, he had never once got it stuck on the farm. He actually said it pulled an old three ton once, but never ever had been stuck. I completely lost count of how many times I had that thing stuck this fall. Uh, it's, you know, the benefit of it not really being worth anything. It's like, well, I guess what's the harm? We might as well keep plowing away and keep getting it stuck. Um, this is a picture of the last time I put the ladder back on because I was so fed up with having to dig it out that I just permanently took it off for the rest of the fall um, and climbed up the tire every time to, to get in. So I, um, I have a small farm, but I do kind of feel everybody's pain. I found it, you know, even for a small farm, I found it fairly stressful and uh, not... I hope something that I don't have to relive again, Ernie, but uh, we'll see. And uh, did experience the same storage challenge as everybody else. Ran fans for longer than I've ever run fans for and accomplished almost no drying at all. And like a lot of Manitoba farms, particularly in the West, don't have much for, for um, supplemental heat. Uh, have an old batch dryer in the trees that I never really wanted to pull out too bad. And I know a lot of people are in this situation. Um, because in Manitoba, we are used to being able to dry with natural aeration. We harvest starts early, it's warm, we have long days, and we can dry really, really efficiently with natural aeration. Obviously, we couldn't do that uh, this year. We had very limited capacity to dry. Um, Lionel, your eyes must be really good because I can't see what any of that says. I wrote it, but I don't remember what it says. <laughs> um, so even early in the season, when we had a couple of really warm days, and I remember specifically of being over 30 and 98% humidity, and so we were all excited, oh man, got to turn the fans on, and then you look like, well, this isn't going to dry anything either, and it's just going to make it worse. Now we're going to add moisture, make it warmer. Um, so yeah, we were, our hands were tied. Um, and then harvest ended up later than normal. Even in a more normal season, when we aren't dealing with really high moisture, um, extremely cold grain, it becomes harder to dry with natural aeration later in the season. The days are shorter. We don't have as much uh, warm temperatures to, to deal with to, to dry. Um, and then to make it worse, we had cold grain. And trying to dry um, cold grain is tough even if we have warm air. It takes a while. First you've got to warm it up and then you start drying. Uh, but trying to dry cold air or cold grain with cold air is 
virtually impossible. So we need to need, uh, know a little bit about um, air's ability to dry and when does air have the capacity to dry. And so I talk about this stuff a lot when people start asking me all these questions about nighttime drying and the reason why this whole idea of nighttime drying is a little bit ludicrous. Um, it, it works in very limited scenarios and I'll talk about it a little bit more, but uh, we, we need to understand these things to understand the limitations of our, of our systems. So 30 degree air, for instance, at 50% relative humidity, this is a one cubic meter of, of air has the ability to hold 30 grams of water. It's 50% relative humidity, so it can take on another 15 grams. If you compare that to 10 degree air, which we were dealing with this fall or less, um, at 75% relative humidity, it is holding six grams and can take on another two. Even if it was really low humidity, which we don't tend to have with colder air, it can only take on eight grams before it's completely saturated and can't take on any more. And this is why cold air just can't dry very well. Also, um, temperature affects the rate of moisture movement. So cold air, if we theoretically blew 10 degree air on canola or wheat or whatever it is for eternity, it will eventually take moisture away, um, but it's really, really slow to, to do that. 30 degree air will do that 10 times faster. So not only does relative humidity and ambient temperature have an impact, what is the condition of the grain itself? And so, like we know it was cold uh, this year, and, and that has an impact on how drying will occur. So if we have warm air, warm grain, ideal situation, what we're used to in southern Manitoba on a normal fall, we will get substantial drying, best case scenario with natural air, air drying. If we have warm air and cool grain, uh, you will initially get some wetting, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, with spring conditioning until you warm up that entire bulk and then drying will occur, of course. If you blow cold air onto warm grain, you will get very, very fast, quick, short-term drying. So if you heard about this nighttime drying thing and how amazing it was, this is exactly what was happening. They were blowing cold air on grain that was taken off the field warm and it was drying very quickly. But what happens when you keep blowing cold air onto warm grain? The grain becomes cold eventually and the ability to dry is done. Um, and then cold air onto cold grain, you have a little, little bit of wetting, but nothing substantial um, and really nothing else happens. Uh, each commodity has an equilibrium moisture content. This is specifically, specific to each commodity that tells you at this temperature and this relative humidity, if you blow it on that specific commodity, what will that commodity equilibrate to? So this is canolas um, and basically we can operate here. So less than 70% relative humidity and greater than 10 degrees Celsius is our opportunity to dry with natural aeration. How often did we get that this fall, Ernie? Not very, right? Yeah. Um, I think this is important to notice. We have to be a little careful with these charts because if, you know, they don't tell you that you know, it shows that it could dry at, at two degrees, but it, it doesn't tell you how slow that would be. Um, but this is important to kind of know this if you're looking at manual fan control and when should I turn fans off and on. Okay, so to your specific question, now that I've gone on a big diatribe about what... What about bag grain, Angela? Uh, yeah. How, how's, that, how, how's that going to winter and what's going to be... How, how are we going to deal with that in the spring? Okay. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit um, to the bagged slide I have here so I can refer to it. I've got a lot of questions about is canola safer in a bag than a bin? Or a lot of people who insist that it is safer in a bag than in a bin. Um, storage research is really, really hard to fund because basically you need to, f to be able to put up the money uh, to, to fund its spoiling. And nobody really wants to do that. So that's expensive, right? So uh, we don't have a lot of really new storage research that's done in commercial size bin, bins. The best recent research we have is this bag storage work out of the U of M. So they did it over four years um, in fairly large like commercial size bags with uh, canola that came off the field at these different moisture contents. And they measured a bunch of different things to see how it was doing in storage over that time period. Um, what I found interesting from this work is how permeable the bag is. 
So a steel bin is a really closed loop. Um, basically what's in there, it's gonna hold that temperature um, for a very, very long time. It's a very closed system, more than I ever expected it to be actually. But a bag isn't. It's really permeable, it changes with ambient conditions really, really quickly. And so that can be a good thing, it can work in your favor or it can work against you. So I think the people's experiences that a bag is better than a bin, it just depends. Um, if you have really high moisture canola in a bag and then it starts to get really, really hot out, that's bad, that's a very bad situation because the bag's gonna warm up faster than your steel bin would. Um, but if you have really high moisture canola in a bag and it's really cold out, it's gonna, it's also gonna be cold in that bag. It's gonna allow that moisture to breathe out of the bag more than a steel bin would, so that's a good thing. So the answer is it depends. That's a good politician's answer, right? Yeah, you're beginning to sound like uh, Premier Palliser now, but... <laughs> but I guess before you move on to your next question, I would just um, show you the results from this. If you're interested in storing canola in bags, you absolutely can do it. It works very, very well. 8% um, canola stored fine without any quality deterioration for up to 40 weeks. 10% um, up to 24 weeks. The really damp stuff that was 12 to 14% had... This is what it looked like. I don't know if you can see that very well, but after three weeks... Um, the really high moisture stuff look like that, so. So again, it depends. Yeah, <laughs> depends. So what do we do about this? I mean, how do, how do we get prepared for this going forward? Um, what can we do on our own farm uh, to try and overcome these challenges? Sure. Um, so I guess first and foremost, what do we do with what we have on farm right now? And, and I wish I had something uh, amazing to tell you that was just going to be a game changer. I don't. But what I can tell you is we can stabilize with cold temperatures. So we, ne assuming you have your canola in bins with aeration, um, on those days that we had last week that were really, really cold, those fans should have been running. Get it as cold as you can possibly get it. We, did, we funded a summer storage uh, project here a number of years ago. And the, one of the growers that we were working with was doing this. They were, every time it got really cold, they ran their fans and, and froze it. We unloaded it, or they unloaded it at the end of June, early July, and it hadn't been touched. And the central core of that bin was minus 25 degrees Celsius. So when I talked about a steel bin being a closed loop, it really is. So, so you can use these cold temperatures to stabilize even high moisture uh, canola. And we learned this from 2016, that people were able to stabilize 15, 16% moisture canola by freezing it and, and getting it as cold as possible uniformly throughout the bin so you're kind of stopping convection currents from, from happening. Um, oh, so here's, here's kind of this example. This is, we have to be careful with storage stuff because this one in particular was done bench scale so it's homogenous in small little bins but it, it showed us the theory of when do things start to spoil. So this is just um, emphasizing my point of how cold temperatures can really help us. So we see the initial moisture content here uh, from 6.7 to 17% and the different temperatures. So if, if just draw your attention to 13.7, um, at 25 degrees, it was visibly spoiled in four days. And you cool that down to five degrees and it wasn't visibly spoiled until 46 days. So in a year like this, I mean, normally we say, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, we would condition that before we were in any situation. But in a year like this, when, you know, maybe you had access to dryer, but, but it wasn't going to be for a couple weeks, um, or you just really weren't sure what to do, or should you hold it? We wanted to know how much time do we have? How much time can I buy with that high moisture canola sitting in the bin? And so this kind of gives you at least a rough idea. I would never put money on it <laughs> that, that that's going to be the case, but at least, you know, can, can give you an idea. What about, what about supplemental heat? Yeah, so um, supplemental heat, a great way to extend the drying season that we have. We just haven't adopted it to a huge degree in southern Manitoba because we haven't really needed it that much. So, you know, a lot of people have maybe a couple bins with, with supplemental heaters set up, but not to the degree of some of the farms that I tour in, nor, you know, more northern latitudes in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, but I would suggest that, you know, maybe after a year like this, we don't want to, I mean, have a really big knee-jerk reaction and, and put them on every bin, but maybe we need to be a little bit better set up with something like supplemental heat. Um, works 
really well, but we found out it's a little bit more hands-on than we maybe once thought. So Pammy did some work with uh, wheat in 5,000 bushel bins and basically found that you need to turn it every day to, to not massively overdry the bottom. So they, they overdried the, the bottom 1,000 bushels and didn't do anything to the 4,000 bushels above it when they didn't turn it. So I used to think we could maybe turn it every three to four days, but it looks like you pretty much have to turn it every day, every second day. Um, it also has limitations um, with the airflow that we have on most of our aeration and fan setups. Um, you don't want to be heating at the plenum. You don't want to be any more than 30 at the most 40 degrees Celsius, or you can physically induce heating at the inlet because we just don't have enough airflow um, to push that out. The other thing is you need to also have good ventilation at the top, if, especially if you're pushing a lot of moisture through or you'll get a lot of condensation at the, at the, top, of the, at the top of the bin. Um, we used to say, if you, you might find old can Canola Council stuff that says you need at least 0.5 cubic feet per minute per bushel, so that's your airflow um, rate, to, to effectively use supplemental heat. We now know you need at least one CFM per bushel to effectively use supplemental heat and, uh, and you know, more would be better. So supplemental heat could be a make work project if you've got nothing to do on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, well, we're all looking for more things to do, right? <laughs> uh, one last quick question here, Angela. Um, what about the, I mean, what kind of costs can we expect on, on for drying grain? I mean, uh, I know it varies with the moisture content and the time of year, but um, are we better off to try and go and combine in, in August or September and dry our grain, or should we actually try and wait for nature to help us out? So I would second what Lionel said. Um, I think I would encourage producers to, to try and get out a little bit sooner, to at least hedge, hedge their bets. Um, you know, I knock on wood, I hope that we don't get a, two years in a row of this, but... Um, but, but at least, you know, start taking stuff off canola. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be super concerned about taking canola off at 10%. And, and a lot of people are waiting for it to come down to 8 in the, in the field. And um, on a year like this, that, that can spell a lot of trouble, right? So I'm going to ask either one of you, uh, Lionel or Angela, Angela, if you've got any closing comments and other words of wisdom for us. Okay, I, lastly, um, I guess I would say that um, we can effectively condition in the spring. So main message is use cold temperatures, monitor diligently, um, and condition in the spring. But just the only caution is if you do what I've told you and get it as cold as possible and then blow warm air, like very warm air on its spring, you will get condensation. So ideally... Uh, start warming it up slowly once, you know, temperatures are warmer than, than the bin. Keep warming it up slowly until you have temperatures, you know, above 15 degrees Celsius where you can actually accomplish drying with, with natural aeration. Um, another, another thing that I, I really caution against is blending. And I, 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 this is a little bit contentious for some people, but I, I'd encourage you to take a bottle of rum to your grain buyer and, and get them to do a paper blend before you start blending on farm. Um, we are just incapable of blending to 100% effectiveness. So we have pockets of high moisture and then pockets of dry. And what always wants to happen in the bin, in the bin is the transfer of moisture. And it, but it happens really, really slowly. So um, you're, you're basically putting your good dry canola at risk now with your high moisture canola. This scenario might not come up that often, but I've had this, the odd time this comes up where um, so, say someone th hypothetically has a bin of dry canola and it's the only space they have uh, with aeration capacity to, to dry and they've got a bunch of 12% canola. My recommendation, and this sounds odd, but my recommendation is put it on top and then condition it. So you're basically creating a, an artificial drying front Air moves really, really fast through dry canola. It's not trying to remove moisture, so, it, so that aeration front moves super fast. Then it hits that 
artificial drying front and will start drying at the top and it's the best place for it to be because its escape is much closer. So it's a lot less energy intensive to, to do it that way than the other way around. If you ever end up in that situation. I mean, ideally you just condition it on its own, but. Um, I just, okay. There's a couple other things um, that we can think about. I think um, we need to maybe pay a little bit more attention to how we're setting up our fans on our bins and it might surprise you to learn that a lot of the people who will be sending out your, your bins uh, with, with fans and aeration setups might not fully understand how to size fans for, for bins. Um, particularly for large bins, and most of us are constrained by single phase power. Um, Pammy did some work here in the last couple of years on 25,000 bushel bins and found that the way that they're normally sent out with two 10 horse fans, um, they stalled out at 17,000 bushels. They could not blow air past 17,000 bushels in those 25,000 bushel bins. So we need to really be careful about this. That's, you're putting a lot of bushels at risk, especially if they're really high moisture, if you can't move that front um, through that. So we, we need to understand airflow, um, understand the restraints of our systems or constraints on our systems and either take some canola out of the bin or change our, our setup. So all of this is available. Uh, you can find it, the manufacturers will provide it. The, you'll get graphs like this. This is per the, the type of fan and it'll tell you airflow rate in the, in the middle here. This is in CFM. The static pressure here in inches of water and the, the fan here. So let's just say a five horse fan, eight inches of, of static pressure, 31, 3,140 CFM. You divide that by the number of bushels you're trying to condition and that'll tell you your CFM per bushel. So ideally you're at one CFM per bushel. So at, at 3,000 there with that five horse fan, you can only condition 3,000 bushels, okay? The other last thing, and then I swear I'll give you the mic back, Lionel, um, is I, I think something that, that we have never really fully appreciated until this year and it was so cold, our grain samples were so cold, is trying to get an accurate moisture measurement with cold grain. Um, so I did some homework with this and started talking to an engineer from NDSU and I was a little bit surprised what I found out. Um, electronic moisture meters are much more sensitive to the outside of the kernel than your traditional 919 or like Labtronics, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, so they get fooled really, really easily by the, out, the condition of the outside of the kernel. Um, and, and you'll get an erroneous reading. Um, they are not accurate under four degrees Celsius, which is kind of, we had a lot of grain under four degrees Celsius. Um, so, you know, this is a big deal. It might not seem like a big deal, but if you, if you do a reading and it tells you it's 10%, well, okay, my 10% is in bin C and D and it's fine. But maybe it was actually 12 had the, the test been done correctly. And it's also a big deal because I, so you start taking samples around to different elevators and all of a sudden you're getting a bunch of different moisture readings from different buyers. And if you're paying for that drying, and if it was like soybeans this fall and you're paying 36 cents a point a bushel, that is a big deal. So we need to understand the, the these aren't bulletproof um, and, and there's some tricks to them. So the best thing you can do is take your sample, put it in a sealed container um, for ideally just overnight at room temperature, let it equilibrate, let the moisture that's maybe on the outside of the kernel go through the kernel and then take your, take your moisture reading and then you'll get an accurate reading. So thank you for sticking with us to, at the end of the day here and I'll kick it back to Lionel. Thanks. Um, just a couple of... Uh points regarding um, what we're going to do this, this spring, and that seems to be the question I'm getting all the time now is, uh, you got a bunch of crop out there, what am I going to do with it? Uh, everybody's got it in their head that it isn't, uh, isn't going to be worth a whole bunch, and uh, so my first caution is uh, uh, don't get too, uh, too 
too jumpy. The crop uh, last year, some of the crop was coming off. It was coming off as feed wheat, but uh, I, mean, I should say this spring, it was coming off as feed wheat, uh, still 13 to 14 percent protein, and guys are still getting paid five dollars a bushel for it. So uh, just because you have a quarter of wheat out there uh, doesn't mean that the value still might, might not be there. So uh, uh, the second thing is uh, Keep in touch with MASC. I know that they're doing, still doing a lot of field checking right now, and make sure you run everything by them before you start doing something, because uh, there may be some options for you, for you there as well. The other question that uh, I seem to be getting a lot of is, what am I going to do to uh, get my field back into uh, condition again for next year and for spring seeding? And uh, I think uh, that's, a, that's, that's one of the more common questions. And uh, first of all, determine what you're going to do with last year's crop. Um, if you're going to just get rid of it, that means burning it or, you know, doing a fire garden, letting it go in the spring. Well, that decision is pretty easy. Um, I guess the big thing is uh, when will you be able to do it and when is the field going to be dry enough? So uh, I think a lot of producers are talking that right now. Uh, there are other options. Uh, if you have beef producers that are close by, uh, there may be some value in getting that, uh, that uh, basically that uh, crop cut and baled and, and, and hauled off the field. Um, discouraging one about that is uh, it's going to take a fair bit of time and uh, producers might not be willing to wait for that time uh, to get it done. So if you have a couple of beef producers in your area, um, run it by them, see if they're interested in it. I mentioned before that uh, a lot of you may be over and above your crop insurance coverage as it is, so there might not be any uh, physical dollars in that field for you uh, right now, uh, but uh, that may be an option if the, the, the grain has sprouted pretty bad. Uh, the, the last point, I guess, that I would like to make is uh, uh, when spring, this spring comes up, uh, don't panic. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now about... Uh, you know, nobody's got their fertilizer on. Uh, what are we going to do to get our, you know, the, the crop, the fields ready to go? Uh, first of all, get the field ready. There's going to be ruts in some of those fields. Uh, learn how to get rid of those ruts first. If you're one pass seeding, uh, there are options uh, where uh, light tillage on the, over the ruts might be enough to, to bring that uh, back into a good seed bed for you to seed through. Um, if that's not going to work, sulfurs might be the answer. Um, Regarding the fertilizer, uh, there are other options besides putting your fertilizer on all before seeding. Uh, phosphate, for sure, we can go down with the seed, but if you need to put on a lot of nitrogen, there are options of putting uh, nitrogen on after seeding. Uh, a lot of producers have been looking at that lately, whether it's broadcasting, whether it's uh, putting a liquid on, and having some really good results to the point where some producers are doing that solely now as they, as they grow their crops. So there's going to be a lot of panic this spring uh, where fertilizer's not in place, equipment's not going to be already available. So uh, I guess always have that in the back of your mind that you don't, uh, you don't need to delay all your seeding operations. Uh, the crop can get going from what's there in the soil and can get going until you're out there applying uh, some uh, additional nutrients. Um, I guess with that, uh, unless there's some questions, I think uh, we've got things covered. Well, thanks very much, Lionel and uh, Angela. And I think there's a takeaway here from Lionel's comments. It's uh, uh, as easy, simple as it is to say, try and get a crop growing and get it, uh, get it harvested in a, t in a timely manner. And uh, with Angela's comments, monitor, monitor, monitor. So on behalf of all of us here, I'll turn it back over to Nikki for some closing comments. All right, no, well, thank you. On behalf of Manitoba Egg Days, we would like to thank you guys very much for your time this afternoon and speaking and sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, yeah, we wish you the best of luck. <laughs>